It was great. Um, I haven't seen him smile a lot in the last year, um, ever since the decision last year at this time. So he was, um, he looked really happy. He was smiling a lot. He was making jokes. Um, he, uh, he, he's a very calm person, um, but I think for the first time I could really see some joy in his face, which I have not seen before. So I think he was elated. This is a wonderful opinion. Um, everyone should read it because it's a treatise on habeas law in Missouri. It's beautifully crafted and it deals with every single detail of the case. And um, I don't think that there's any way that it will be overturned, but if they want to battle on, we're always up for a fight. So we'd rather not have it go that way. Now, people seem to have the impression, uh, people on the street, that he's uh, being released because he's not guilty, when in fact the actual reason for release is this technicality. Uh, no. What is the reaction? Well, now, that? now, constitutional violations are not technicalities. There are, there are Brady violations. It's the most serious thing that can happen with a trial. When the court has said this trial was not fair because it violated the Constitution, this is not a technicality. And then the court went through meticulously all the numerous pieces of evidence that were undisclosed to the defense. Um, so this was not a fair trial. And they analyzed it all against the backdrop of the two main witnesses having recanted and saying that they had committed perjury. So make no mistake about it, there's no case in the United States like this case. Um, so it's, it's not a technicality. That's a layman's term, but that's not a correct legal term. There's no civil Well, you know, it, it, would, it would seem to be um, hard to believe, but I don't want to presume anything in this case. Um, hopefully rational minds will prevail and look at this, um, what's to be gained by it. But I could not guess what will happen, uh, what they will decide to do. It's really not an issue in this. I think the court, in, in this sense, the court was careful to say it didn't matter if the prosecutor knew about all these violations. It was the fact that these violations had all occurred. In fact, the language that they used was it was the trademark, the trademark of this prosecution. And whether it was an investigator or the prosecutor knew made no difference to this court, but there were numerous violations that were described in the court opinion. I feel like you've done more than a dozen of these. Um, can you explain why, well, to the audience who says, why does it take so long to get a resolution in a case like this? Why does it take you know, nine years, seven months to get a resolution like this? Well, this is our 15th exoneration, my office, and there have been three people that we've gotten exonerated while we've been working on Ryan's case, the last person that we got out just a month ago had been in 23 years. Now, we had only represented him for a year, but it's just the nature of the, of the review process. It's extremely difficult. It's really simple to convict someone who's innocent if you have witnesses who are lying. It's very simple. It is unbelievably difficult and complex to undo a conviction like that. And you can tell, that's why I recommend everyone study this opinion, because it shows the complexity of the law and how difficult this is. Um, courts don't like recognizing that mistakes have been made. But the Brady violations really deal with the fairness of the trial. Did this person have a fair trial? And that's what this case, that's why the conviction was vacated. This was not a fair trial. And can you clarify for us uh, if there's any legal action that your office or the Ferguson family can take uh, against the state or any other party to uh, you know, rectify the years that you spent in prison? Well, certainly there is. But until Ryan Ferguson is sitting at the Thanksgiving table, I'm not going to sit here and, 
and talk really about that. Just to say to you that there are civil rights cases. We're doing a trial in Washington next month for a police officer who was framed and was in for 20 years. So yeah, there are there's civil actions, but we just want to get Ryan Ferguson out the front door of the prison. So. I'd like to hear Ryan. Uh, yes, we were fortunate to speak to him early this morning, and uh, he was extremely happy, obviously, elated, relieved, but knowing that we had a long battle ahead of us, as Kathleen just mentioned, with the state deciding whether or not they're going to pursue another trial or not. And until he's free, then he's not free. And you looked at the hearing, at the, at the ruling this morning very early, and you guys have gone Well, we always knew that uh, that he would be free eventually. It was, wasn't, a, uh, wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. So when we read the unanimous, and I cannot emphasize that enough, the unanimous opinion of all three judges who actually looked at the case rather than a uh, rubber stamp it like we've seen in the past, then uh, we always knew this day would come. And, and it really gives you confidence when you have a great attorney. I think that that's an un unusual comment because the standard is, is the verdict worthy of confidence? But for the court to go on and say that it's not worthy of judicial or public confidence, I think, speaks to the fact that common sense would tell anyone that when you don't have any evidence, someone should not continue to be locked up. So, I mean, I think the court went extremely far in, in condemning what had happened. 